How about now? Woo! Magical. All the difference a button makes. Okay. As I was saying, my name is Perry. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. It's great to be with you this morning as we open up God's Word together. Back in 1975, a man named Roger Hart conducted research on where children felt safe to play. He went to a small Vermont town and he found 86 kiddos between the ages of three and 12 years old. And he just observed their habits on how far away they went from their homes with their parents' approval to play during the day. And then he plotted that distance on a map. So each little kiddo got a little radius for how far they were willing to, to go away from their home during the day with mom and dad's approval. What he found were that the younger kids, the four and five-year-olds, would generally stay within their own neighborhoods. But the older kids, the 10 to 12-year-olds, would have free reign of the whole town, no problem. In 2014, he went back and visited these once free-range children and who, they were, who are now parents with kids of their own. And he surveyed their own kids now, and he observed their own habits, and he found now that most of the kids in the group merely took him to the edge of their property. He took him just, they took him just to the edge like the fence line, said, this is it. So the circles that he had plotted in 1975 just dwarfed those of 2014. And what had changed? Well, if you looked at the crime rate from 2014 back to 1975, there was literally no difference. It was completely the same. So he interviewed the moms and dads, and it became crystal clear right at the start of what was going on. There was one thing that had kept their kids closer to home. It was like an invisible leash. In a word, it was fear. Fear is what had kept them so much closer to their homes. And even when they would wander out, the parents insisted that they know where their children were at all times. In the words of this article where it's all described, it says, fear of the world outside our door narrows the circle of our lives. Fear is big business. Fear will sell products. We buy things just for the peace of mind that it will ensure. Fear makes headlines all over the place. When you hear of wars and the economy and all of these things that might stir up fear within us, it sells newspapers, which is a relic of the past. You kids, it's, ask your parents about it. But it sells headlines and it makes the news all over because fear is something that just stirs each one of us up. But fear for Christians is a big problem, not because of how it might restrict the free movement of our children, but because of how it might restrict the free movement of our faith. As we follow Christ, we are called to take part in his kingdom advancing purposes and mission. And as we do that, it's inevitable that eventually we will run into things that will stretch us, that will call for courage, that will even strike up fear inside of us. If we retreat from fear, we have a big problem if we're trying to be faithful to Christ. So this morning, we're going to take a look at a passage of scripture out of Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 22, to see how when we follow Jesus, sometimes he even leads us into a storm. Luke chapter 8, verse 22. Let me start off with that now. One day, Jesus got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep, and a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. So this starts off innocently enough. It starts off innocent because Jesus is saying, let's just go to the other side of the lake. How harmless could that be? The lake, of course, being the Sea of Galilee. If you know anything about the Sea of Galilee, it is famous for its outbursts regarding its weather. The topography of the area is such that the wind can change just like that. And it'll churn and stir up these storms so that when you're out on the water, you're in a very precarious state. You're not firmly planted on ground like we are, but out in the middle of a lake, that can be really bad if a storm whips up. This is Jesus's idea to go across the lake. It's not Peter or James or John's. They're the professional fishermen in the bunch, but this is Jesus's idea. And right away, we see that when we follow Jesus, he may actually lead us 
into a storm. That should make us question our own assumptions and expectations of the Christian life, of what it should look like for us as we follow Christ. If we're expecting in our minds that it should always be smooth seas, we might be in for a rude awakening. When we follow Jesus, he may lead us into that place of fear, where we're out in a place we don't know what to do, and we can just see that we're taking on water, and it's only getting worse. Right after this, then, Jesus, we see in in verse uh, 24, rather, and they went and they woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. Just hear the emotion in their voice as they repeat this word. They don't know what to do. This is, in a word, it's a state of helplessness. It's a state of being hopeless. Have you ever been in that place where you can just tell that the danger is only getting worse? The situation is not getting any better. You have no power inside of your own self to be able to affect a change. And meanwhile, Jesus feels like he's asleep, or it feels to you like he's asleep, that he's unconscious, that he's aware that he's not noticing. This can happen in all different areas of our life where we get into some kind of predicament. We have no idea of what to do. Everything we've tried has not worked. And it seems like God isn't even paying attention. Or maybe he doesn't even care. I think what's going on here, I think Jesus is demonstrating to us what it looks like to be a person who puts trust in the character and in the power of God in the middle of a storm. What Jesus knows and the disciples seem to have forgotten is that this is a God who is completely trustworthy. If we look at Psalm 121, I think we could point to this as something that Jesus is aware of. He will not let your foot be moved, meaning God, but he he who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Even when we are asleep, even when we are resting, even when we are not aware of the world going on around us, God is aware. Jesus knows this. So even in a storm, he can catch some rest. I think Jesus may also have in the back of his mind, Psalm 107. We actually sang a song based off of this, these words earlier this morning, but The psalmist here is taking these different scenarios of people within Israel, and one of these scenarios is that some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. Keep going. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wit's end. We can just see the seas going up and down. And these people are just not sure what to do because it's getting crazy out on the water. And then next slide. And then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, no kidding, and he brought them to their desired haven. Jesus is demonstrating what it looks like to be somebody who can trust in God's power, in God's character, in God's awareness, even when we are in the middle of a storm. We would do well to remember that. So next, here's what the disciples do. They woke him saying, Master, we are perishing. And then Jesus awoke, and he rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. Just immediately, there's this calm. The word rebuked here is very deliberate because Luke is making a connection here to Psalm 106 and other passages out of the Old Testament where it says that God rebuked the Red Sea, and it became dry, and he led them through the deep as through a desert. Luke is tying the activity of God in the Old Testament, leading God's people through the waters. He's connecting that directly with what Jesus is doing here in this moment. That Jesus himself is also in that same kind of act, rebuking the waters, and the waters obey him. The natural question that's in the disciples' mind, that should be in everybody's mind, is then, who is this man? 
But Jesus looks at them in the calm of that moment and he asks them a question. He says, where is your faith? That's an interesting response from Christ. Where is your faith? It's not, why don't you have more faith? You need more faith. But where, where is your faith? It's like the disciples have faith, but they left it back in Galilee before they got on the boat. It's like they haven't learned to take their faith with them as they travel. Maybe we can relate to something about that in our own lives. How is your faith when you're in the office at work? Do you take your faith with you there? How about your faith in the neighborhood when you're interacting with your neighbors who do not yet know the Lord? How is your faith in those moments? How about your faith when you receive the bad news about your health or the the health of a loved one around you? How about your faith when you see the downturn in the economy and you see it affecting your own banking? How has your faith been in those moments? Jesus is saying, where is your faith in this very moment, in this storm? Because your faith is what's going to help you here in the face of this fear that you're feeling. You need your faith in every single situation in life. And that question just rings out in their ears and in their soul. And meanwhile, they ask a question of their own. They said, who is this? As they marvel and they're afraid. Who is this that he commands even the winds and the water and they obey him? Jesus has absolute power over everything in the natural world that might threaten us. Jesus has absolute control, and he's showing them that in this moment of fear, that faith is the remedy to that. That a faith that travels, that goes with them in any situation, in any circumstance, it will make all of the difference in terms of how they respond to the fears that they face. And Jesus has power over everything every single thing that might endanger their lives. But if we remember, Jesus has a purpose in mind for this day. He's not just taking them out into the middle of the lake to show them this cool stunt with the weather. But Jesus has a purpose, remember it? It's to get to the other side. Jesus wants to go over to the other side of the lake The other side of the lake is a region where there were 10 cities, and it's largely Gentile territory. The other side of the lake is like going over to the other side of the tracks, the area you don't want to cross into, because over there, those aren't the people that you hang out with. They're not your friends. They're not your family. They're not your associates. The other side of the lake, though, is exactly where Jesus wants to go, and it's just Stunning to see who Jesus would meet as soon as he steps on the shore. Because a welcoming party for this people who are like strange to the Israelites comes and meets him right away. Let's read that. It says this, Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time, he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house, but among the tombs. So the country of the Gerasenes is this area that's opposite, that's away from Israel's territory, on the other side of the lake. This is where Jesus wanted to head to in the first place. And Jesus gets out and immediately is confronted by this man who has demons, We see the the power of what's going on in his life. We see the adverse effect that has caused him. He's, He's naked. He's not living in his house, but he's living among death and decay. The demons have taken him away from his normal life, and it's like he's a wild animal now. He's out away from the people he loves and who know him, and instead he's enslaved to these demons. The Bible says a couple of things about demons that we might want to just point out as we, before we go any further. We could read passages like 2 Peter 2.4 or here Jude chapter 6 and we see 
The angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, God has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Demons are God's creation. They rebelled against God, and their destruction is certain. Now, we live in a scientific, post-enlightenment kind of world where, because of our scientific mind frame, we may just say, well, oh, okay, the demonic, we know that that's just an ancient attempt to explain things that were unexplainable in their day. They didn't understand the chemical imbalances that can go on inside of a human being. And so the demons are just an attempt to explain what was going on back then. But we should keep in mind that even in Jesus' day, they had categories for the demonic and the physical. They understood a difference between those things and even psychological problems. Jesus heals people of diseases, but he also heals them of demonic activity in their lives. So they, even in that ancient mindset, understood a difference between something that's physical and something that's spiritual. We should not just dismiss demons and say, well, they don't actually exist. But neither should we be overly interested in the demons. Neither, neither should we give them more attention than they deserve or to think that a demon exists behind every rock. There's a famous quote from C.S. Lewis where he talks about these two errors that we might make. He says, there are two equal and opposite errors into which we can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence, and the other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. We should not give them more attention. We should not say that the demons are everywhere, that we should just study them and learn more about them. No, we should actually just try to stay away from anything that smells of demonic. But at the same time, we should not deny that they exist. There are spiritual beings active and present in the world who are opposed to God. But we should not give them more credit than they're due because there is no struggle going on here between the demons and Jesus. Let's take a look at that. As we keep reading in here, we see when he saw Jesus, this man who's full of the demons, he, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded, Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he, would not, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? And he said, legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. So we see that the disciples asked earlier, who is this who commands even the winds and the water and they obey him? One consistent theme about Jesus and demonic beings is that they have no trouble identifying who Jesus is. This is not the first time in Luke's account where, he, where Jesus has driven out demons. He did it back in Capernaum, back on the other side, the home side of the lake. He drove out a demon of a man in the synagogue in Capernaum and somebody else around that same area already in Luke. But this is the first time where Jesus has traveled outside of that region and now is confronted by somebody. But in every occasion, they know exactly who Jesus is, and they give him this name. This is not a name of worship, though. It's just a name of recognition, and it's actually a name of submission. We should not give the demons more credit, because look at what the demons have to revert to here in front of Jesus' face. But we learn more about their, their impact on this man's life. We read that he's been bound because he has this extraordinary strength. And he's able to break free of these bonds, but the demon would just drive him out into the wilderness, into for, further isolation. Again, reinforcing that idea of this man, this human being, this image bearer of God is more like a wild animal than he is a human. How sad, how tragic that this man's life has been so devastated. It says in John 10 that the thief, the devil, comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And we see that the devil's followers, the demons, are doing that exact thing in this man's life. But there is no 
struggle going on between Jesus and the demons. The man reveals his name as Legion. A legion could refer to as many as five or even 6,000 men in a Roman army. We don't know how many demons are inside of this man. Could be thousands, but certainly more than just a couple. But the point is, Jesus is severely outnumbered on this occasion. Before, he had driven out a single demon out of each person. But here, he's driving out a whole legion of demons who he's facing. But notice the language that Luke uses here. On a couple of occasions, he uses the word beg. Go to the, there we go. He said, no, go to that next slide. There we go. There we go. Stay there. Verse 28, I beg you, do not torment me. Verse 31, and they begged him not to command them to depart into the, bit, the abyss. Why would they beg him? Because whatever Jesus commands, they have no choice but to follow. There is no struggle here between Jesus and the demons. This is not like a Marvel superhero movie where we're wondering the outcome. Jesus doesn't break a sweat doing this against them. They are begging him to have mercy on them. And they're about to beg him even once more. Let's keep reading. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they, here's the word again, they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. What an odd twist in this story. What a bizarre turn of events. It's possible that what we're supposed to see here is a visualization of what Jesus is doing. They begged, they begged Jesus to not send them into the abyss. The abyss is like a permanent dungeon, a binding of the demonic beings and evil spirits. It's a place also that can be used to refer to the final judgment of the demons. So they begged Jesus, anything but that, send us into the pigs. And it's possible that Jesus grants that request to visualize to everyone who's there to see it what is happening. You can see this in this graphic, vivid imagery of the demons leaving the man who's now in his right mind, and meanwhile, the pigs are rushing down the edge of the cliff and into the lake. There would be no mistaking that Jesus had actually accomplished this in the man's life. They see the herd rush down. The book of Mark tells us in the same account that there were around 2,000 animals in this herd. Maybe there were around 2,000 demons that had been in this man who is now free. What we see is that Jesus has complete power and authority over the demonic. Jesus has complete authority and power over the natural disaster of the storm. And if we were to keep reading in this chapter, which I wish we had time for, we would see that Jesus also has power over disease and even over death itself. You might recognize those accounts of where Jesus is confronted by Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue back in Capernaum, whose 12-year-old daughter is suffering. She's on her deathbed, and Jesus agrees to go with him to go see her so he can heal her. But along the way, he, he bumps up against a major crowd that delays his progress. And meanwhile, in that crowd, a woman touches him who's been bleeding for 12 years suffering from a terrible disease. Jesus asks, who touched me? Who touched me? And she comes trembling before Jesus' feet. And he said, your faith has healed you. How incredible. But meanwhile, Jairus receives word alongside of Jesus that his daughter has died. Jesus says to Jairus, do not fear, only believe and she will be well. Luke has sandwiched all of these accounts together that, to show us that Jesus has authority over natural disaster, over the demonic, over disease, and over death. Everything that might take us out. Jesus has complete control and power over everything, over all things. So we can trust him at all times. There's nothing in the world outside of our door 
that can actually take us out when we put our faith in Christ. There's nothing that can destroy us. Jesus is able to deliver us through or from everything that might threaten our own lives. So we would think on this occasion where Jesus goes to the other side of the lake that maybe what's going on here is that Jesus is bringing the gospel, the good news for all people to this people so that there would be this massive evangelism going on right after he has just released the demons from this man. But let's read about what happens there next. It says this in verse 34, when the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found that the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. So we can just see now, of course, now the man's family, the man's friends, the ones who knew him when he was a little boy, surely they're just going to come and they're going to come to Jesus and put their faith in Christ. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. There's a whole lot of fear going on in this chapter. Have you noticed? There's the fear of the disciples in the storm. There's the fear of the disciples after the storm. And who is this man that even the wind and the waters obey him? There's the, the man with the demons now who has had them cast out and he's incited fear because of all that Jesus has done in their lives, in his man's life. There was the fear that the woman felt as she was healed of something that had plagued her for 12 years. And there was the fear of Jairus when he discovered that his daughter had actually died. But in all of those other occasions, the fear was productive. It was a fear that actually led to a deeper devotion to Jesus. But here with these herdsmen, the people of the Gerasenes, we see that their fear is a fear that drives them away from Jesus. The people who are in the greatest danger in this entire chapter of lots of threatening things are these people of the Gerasenes. These people of the Gerasenes have one thing that will take them out, and that is a hard heart towards the work of Christ. They're actually the ones facing, facing the most threatening set of circumstances. It's not the storm. It's not even the demonic activity in that man's life. It's not the disease. It's not even death. But it's a hardened heart that will not respond to what Jesus has done. That is the greatest threat any of us could face. Jesus, though, even in light of their hardness of heart, has mercy. Let's finish off the story. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. Then he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. It seems kind of surprising that Jesus wouldn't welcome him to follow him as one of his disciples and go back on the other side of the lake to go to Galilee and just become a 13th apostle with him. But instead, Jesus' command for this man to go is to go back home. Go back among the people whose hearts are currently hard. Go back among the people who refuse to acknowledge what God has done for you and tell them. Be the daily reminder as they see you in your life, as they see you in your right mind, fully clothed. As they see you go about your life now that has been set free because of the powerful work of God. Maybe that day-by-day -day testimony will actually chip away at the hardness of their own hearts so they would fall at the feet of the master, the one who has power over all things. We see God's mercy on display, even in this final stage of this story. What a beautiful thing to think that we have a God who is all-powerful and who is 
saved us, rescued us from everything that might threaten us. He may not deliver us from every threat. He might deliver us through threats. We know that one day, if he does not return first, all of us will face death. But we know that he has overcome that death. And it's by his grace that we can live a life free of the fear that would paralyze us, free of the fear of those things outside our door that might keep us from living a life of faith for his purposes and as a part of his kingdom. That's the quote we started with, right? That fear of the world outside our door narrows the circle of our lives. But because of what Jesus has done, he has overcome everything outside of our door that might threaten us. He has power over all things, so we can trust him at all times. This is the God who loves us and who is all-powerful and who wants us to live with the kind of freedom that comes to serve him with confidence, knowing that he can overcome whatever threatens us today. I don't know what you might be facing right now. I don't know what kind of threatening circumstances you might have in your own life. But let this be an encouragement to you that Jesus wants you to live even in the face of that threat with a great faith in him. So let me ask, where is your faith this morning? We can have confidence that Jesus is with us, that he's aware of what's going on in our lives and that he wants to rescue us. Right before Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he said, your heavenly father knows what you need before you even ask. We can live with that confidence and that hope this morning as we worship him. Let's pray. Father, I pray for my friends this morning. I pray for myself. I include myself in that, Lord, that you would give us the kind of confidence that comes from knowing that you are a God who is good, that you are all powerful, that you have already overcome all things so that we can trust you at all times, Lord, in any circumstance. Lord, I pray that you would help us in the current struggles that we might be facing today or in the ones that we're not yet facing but will face in the near future. Lord, I pray you would just give us a hope, the hope of these stories that might be so familiar to us because we've heard them dozens of times. Lord, but I pray the hope would just be fresh this morning that this would be a fresh reminder to us of your power, Lord, your power to change our circumstances, your power to deliver us from from all that might plague us, from all that might threaten us, or from all that might cause us to want to just retreat and live a more safe, comfortable, comfortable life, Lord. We look to you, God, to do what only you can do in us. And we pray for your power to be on display in and through our lives. We ask all of this now in the mighty and glorious name of Jesus. Amen.